Number 11, Spirit of God and Christ. So I want to begin by asking the question, what is the Spirit? What is God's Spirit? You might say, well, what do you mean what, Sean? Who is the Spirit? All right, okay. Look, I'm not, I'm not looking to, to, to uh, start with any assumptions here. Let's check the Bible dictionaries. Bible dictionaries are great on a big topic like the Spirit of God. And so I, I checked the Dictionary of Judaism in the biblical period, and I read, it says, when used of living beings, ruach, that's the Hebrew word for spirit there, ruach, not ruach, not ruach, not ruach, ratch, ruach, you got to really get it in the throat there. Uh, but when used of living beings, ruach refers to the essence of the life and vitality in both human beings and animals that is manifested through movement and breathing. Just as spirit was considered the essence of human life, so analogously, the term spirit was used of the presence, activity, and power of God. Man, I think that's pretty good. We could just go home right there. Spirit is used of the presence, activity, and power of God. That is, characteristics that demonstrate that God is truly a living God. So uh, what this... Bible Dictionary is saying, and they're citing all sorts of verses here to uh, give, give credence to their take on this, is that the spirit, whether we're talking about a, human, a human's spirit or ruach, it's actually the same word as the word breath, okay? And we don't have that in English. We have spirit and breath are two different words, but in Hebrew and in Greek, it's the same exact word, and also wind, Wind, spirit, and breath are the same exact word. So that flavors how they think about it, but it doesn't do that for us in English. And so it's important for us to adjust to what the biblical language is rather than um, miss out on something. Another dictionary called the New Bible Dictionary said, at its heart is the experience of a mysterious, awesome power, the mighty invisible force of the wind, the mystery of vitality, the otherly power that transforms all ruach, all manifestations of divine energy. So once again, another definition of the Spirit of God. James Dunn put it this way. He said, There can be little doubt that from the earliest stages of pre-Christian Judaism, spirit, or ruach, denoted power, the awful, mysterious force of the wind, of the breath, of life, of ecstatic inspiration. In other words, on this understanding, spirit of God is, no, is in no sense distinct from God, but is simply the power of God, God himself acting powerfully in nature and upon men. So this is a nice definition, I think, for us to work with, that the spirit is not separate from God or distinct from God in the sense that it has its own personality, but instead that it is uh, the... Uh, a way of talking about God being present and doing things. So when we look at the usages of Ruach in the Old Testament, there are lots of them. I'm just going to machine gun through here. Uh, we see in each one God's doing something, right? So the first one, Numbers 11, 17, Spirit of God is taken from one and distributed to others. In 1 Samuel 10, 10 6, the Spirit inspires prophecy. In 2 Samuel 23, 2, it's a way God speaks to the people. In 1 Kings 18.12, the Spirit leads someone to a different location. In 2 Kings 2.16, the Spirit transports someone from one location to another. That's pretty cool. Uh, In Isaiah 61.1, the Spirit is parallel with the anointing of Yahweh. So in Hebrew poetry, you have one line and then the other line, and they're both saying the same thing. That's what I mean by parallel. So it's just another way of talking about God's anointing is God's Spirit. In Judges 3.10, the Spirit empowers leaders to judge or rule the people. In uh, Judges 6.34 and some other places, the Spirit imparts warlike energy and confidence. Or in the case of Samson, Judges 15.14, it supplies supernatural strength. Uh, 1 Samuel 11.6-7, the Spirit causes righteous anger. Or in Isaiah 32.15, it imparts peace. In Isaiah 11... This is a super spirit verse. 
Uh, the Spirit gives wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, the fear of Yahweh, and the ability to judge justly. In Exodus 31.3, the Spirit endows artisans with skill. Those are the ones that made the tabernacle. They were inspired or empowered or enabled by the Spirit of God. And then last of all, in Psalm 139.7, probably the most important of all these, is that uh, the Spirit is in parallel with God's presence. I'll, I'll come back to that in just a minute. But I just wanted you to get, get a flavor for what that big part of our Bibles called the Old Testament says about the Spirit before we get into the New Testament and see uh, how things adjusted. Each of these listed functions of the Spirit refers to the one God, Yahweh, in action. It's not like, it's not like a totally independent empowerment, but it's actually just talking about what God's doing. Uh, in action. It's not independent from God, in other words, is what I'm saying. So this brings me to the whole question of transcendence versus imminence. I know those are probably words you're not all that familiar with. They're a bit philosophical. But they're really the best two words to describe this. So the idea is that God is, is, is not here. God is in heaven. God can't be here. Uh, a few sessions ago, number seven, Jesus, God's agent, we looked at five scriptures that say God has never been seen. Why can't God be seen? Well, God says to Moses, if you see my face, you'll die. I mean, there, there's a holiness, a power to God that, in a sense, he is, he's not here, he's other, he's beyond, and that's the, the idea of transcendence. Um, but then there's another aspect of God that he's able to know all the hairs on your head. Not a bird, not a dumb sparrow hits the ground without our Father knowing it. So that's imminence. That, that's the idea that he's here and that he's present. So he's not here and he's here. How do you, <laughs> how do you work that all out? Well, I believe that that's what Psalm 139.7 is talking about. Psalm 139.7, if you remember it, very famous verse. Uh, the psalmist says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? God's Spirit is how He is present in our world. Does that make sense? It's not an independent person. It is the person of the Father present among us. Uh, and Patrick Navis, I think, described this well. He said, the Spirit is God's active approach to us. What do you think about that? God's active approach to us. Where the Spirit operates, there God Himself is at work. The Spirit is not a thing over against God, but a way of expressing God in his relation to us. Where the Spirit is given a personal quality, such as teaching, revealing, witnessing, interceding, creating, and so on, it's not as an entity distinct from God, but as God himself doing these things, and not yet compromising his transcendence. All right, so let's dig a little deeper into this. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10 says, this is, this is really, I think, probably the most important verse, but also often neglected in discussions about the Holy Spirit. Uh, but I think this is just super, super important. 1 Corinthians 2.10, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, you notice that the S on spirit is capitalized when it refers to God, and then it's lowercase when it refers to just regular people. I think that's a little cheesy. I'm sorry. <laughs> in, the, in the Greek that the translators use, the, any, any critical Greek text that you would use, they all lowercase spirit all the time. So the translators are choosing which ones to uppercase. And they're like, well, it's, it's God's Spirit, so let's make it a capital so people realize this is talking about the third person of the Trinity. And it's like, I don't think we can read that in. You know, let's just let it say what it says. And if you want to build a Trinity doctrine on that, that's your business. But like, let's just let it be what it is. Uh, so I prefer a lowercase. Uh, so I just lowercase the ESV here. Um, my own personal pet peeve, maybe, maybe it doesn't bother you, so don't worry about it if it doesn't bother you. 
But um, so you have all these usages of spirit in these two verses here. And really, for my money, this is, this is the one that I think is just so important right here. The, for the spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Right there. That is just so key. The Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So what are we saying the Spirit is? The Spirit is uh, a, a, uh, an aspect of yourself that knows what's going on. <laughs> I don't know how to, how to say it clearer than that. I think the Spirit is, when we try to define it too carefully, if you want to call it like a technology, I think that's just a little crass. I mean, it's this, it's this insider perspective on what you're thinking about is what uh, the Spirit is according to this verse here. And I think that really helps. It's not an independent reality from the Father, but an aspect of Him that He can, this is the thing about God that's different than you, He can project His Spirit into the world to be present here too. I, I guess we do that with technology, don't we? We take our phones and we say, hey, how's it going? And then we can even look at our phone and, and we can see, you know, it's sort of like how we use technology is uh, similar to that, but God's technology obviously is <laughs> far beyond ours, even if you want to call it technology, but uh, he's uh, obviously far superior. So let me just cover with you five reasons why God's spirit is not a quote-unquote, distinct person apart from the Father. I think God's Spirit is the Father. I don't think it's another person than the Father. And these are my, these are my five reasons. Uh, the Spirit does not have its own name. The Spirit never sends greetings. The Spirit is God's. The, the, number four, the Spirit is never the recipient of prayer. And the Spirit is routinely left out of key passages. So I'm just going to go through these five and then I want to look at three problem passages, ones that people get confused about, and that'll round out our time on the Holy Spirit. So first up, the Spirit does not have its own name. Absolutely unthinkable in the biblical world. Unthinkable. There are no good scenarios or good situations where someone doesn't have a name. Your name is such a big deal in the Bible. Anytime some huge event happens, Someone's name has changed. Or to have your name stricken from the record is like the greatest insult. They, they actually would do this, and you can, you can compare them with like Chronicles and, and Kings and Samuel. You'll see that in, in some places you, you have a name that has Baal, the Canaanite god, in it, and they change it to Bosheth. So Ish Baal, which is, uh, was, uh, I believe, Saul's son, the king Saul's son, in another a parallel account, they call him Ish-bosheth instead of Ish-baal, because Bosheth means shame. <laughs> Baal is this other god, so they change his name to uh, man of shame instead of man of Baal. And uh, so like to have your name messed with or stricken from the record is just unthinkable. So for the spirit not to have a name is just, it's not just weird, it's, it's unthinkable in the biblical world. Of course, the father has a name. His name is Yahweh or Pronounced in different, people have different views on how to pronounce it, Yehovah, or there's other ideas too. Uh, but yeah, there's a name, and we could spell it. We're just not exactly sure how to say it, right? And then Jesus, his mom probably called him Yeshua, but we call him Jesus. You know, that's just an English translation. But yeah, he's got a name. So what's the Spirit's name? Hmm. Number two, the Spirit never sends greetings. Uh, hopefully this won't be considered blasphemy against the Spirit, but the Spirit's the shy one in the Trinity. Sorry, that, that, that was over the line. Over the line. All right, you know what I'm talking about, greetings, right? Here's Romans 1.7. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. How many times have you read a verse like this? Right? So many times it's in Ephesians and you know, all these different epistles. We see greetings, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. No, not and the Holy Spirit. That's weird. If the Holy Spirit is on the same level and as an independent reality or, or consciousness or however you want to say it, a self uh, independent from the Father and the Son, then we would want to find greetings from the Spirit as well, right? The Spirit never sends greetings. Number three, the Spirit is God's. Uh, this, 
I think is an important idea. It's not necessarily obvious. You know, if I say, well, hey, this is my phone here. This is Sean's phone. This is the phone of Sean. You know, we, we, see, we see the uh, spirit called the spirit of God. But rarely do our translations put God's spirit. I think if they just put God's spirit, we'd be like, oh, yeah, it's God's spirit. And so that verse we looked at, who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him, this is God's, this is the Father's spirit. You know, it's his internal pointer of uh, reality or index of his thoughts. I don't know how you want to define it. But it's God's. It's not, it's not independent of God. And, you know, if you, if you take my phone, then we're going to have problems. Because it's, it's Sean's phone, Right? If you say, oh, no, that's not your phone. That's an independent reality de- devoid of any ownership. We're going to have problems, right? Because I paid money for this phone. Uh, all right, number four, the Spirit is never the recipient of prayer. I'll show you a couple examples of prayer here. John sixteen twenty three. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. This is stereotypical prayer in the Bible. Almost always. Not always, but almost always to the Father. And then uh, we have this coming in, in the name of Jesus, right? Anything you ask, the Father in my name. And then Jesus, this is kind of a rare usage, but Jesus says in John 14, 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Look at that. You could pray to Jesus. So, what, 99 out of 100 usages, 999 out of 1,000 usages, <laughs> I don't know what it is, uh, it's to the Father. And then, you know, there's a couple of little scattered places where people uh, pray to Jesus. And, um, but where, what about the Spirit? Nobody ever, not even once, prays to the Spirit. You could pray about the Spirit. Look at Luke eleven thirteen. 13. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Ask who? Ask the Father. So the Father is in charge of dispensing the Holy Spirit in, when we come to Him in prayer. Number five, the Spirit is routinely left out of key passages. So I've got one, two, three, four, five passages here. Uh, I realize this is somewhat of an argument from silence. You know, you're familiar with that? An argument from silence is where you build a case based on what's not there. <laughs> okay? Um, but let's, let's just think about it carefully for a minute. If the Spirit is this, its own being, its own person, or however you want to describe it, its own self, so that it can interact independent of the Father and the Son or in concert with the Father and the Son, then we should expect to find people talking to the Spirit or talking about the Spirit in a very personal kind of way. And that is, in fact, what we are missing in these passages. Matthew eleven twenty seven says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Where's the Spirit? It's just the Father and the Son. They're having, a, they're having a, a powwow over here, and the Spirit's just like over there like, what about me, guys? No, I mean, <laughs> the Spirit is not an independent person, so it's not offended by that. Mark 13, 32. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So here we have the angels, we have the Son, we have the Father. Spirit's left out. James 1.1, 1, 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James, you forgot the Spirit, bro. You know, what happened here? 1 John 1, 1.3, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. Fellowship's a good word, a good community word. You have fellowship with other individuals, right? Um, I mean, I guess you can share popcorn too. It doesn't have to be a person. <laughs> that you share or fellowship. But uh, it says, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. What about the Spirit? The Spirit got left out. Revelation 3.21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my Father on His throne. 
How come the Spirit doesn't have a throne? Where is the Spirit's throne? Now you see why I don't usually draw letters, because I couldn't do it with a regular pen. Why am I trying to do it with a stylus? All right, so let's look at, let's look at three scriptures that uh, often get misunderstood by Christians and get pointed to and, and confused. Uh, the first one is Acts 5. It's the incident with Ananias and Sapphira, where they say, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. And then Matthew 12 is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And then John 14 to 16 is probably the biggest and most significant one, most referred to. And that's where Jesus describes the ministry of the Spirit, that Jesus is going to leave, the Spirit is going to come, and what the Spirit is going to do, the ministry of the Spirit. All right, so let's look at the first one there. Acts chapter 5, But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie, there it is, lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Right. So you have lied to the Holy Spirit here, and then you have lied to God. Bada boom, bada bang. The Holy Spirit just is God in some, uh, you know, because you can't lie to a thing. Right. I, I can't say, well, I, I, I'm lying to that chair over there. You can lie on the chair, but you can't lie to the chair, right? So in order to be lied to, and I completely agree with this, uh, you, you have to have a person in mind, right? That makes perfect sense. I guess you could lie in the mirror, but you're really just lying to yourself in that case because you're the one you're looking at when you look in the mirror. Um, well, my response to this is that, first of all, let's think about Peter. Peter's the one talking here. Peter's the one that says, your, uh, Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. When, um, and then you have not lied to man but to God. Peter's the one that said those words. So when Peter says the word God, what does Peter mean? And if we look at how Peter uses the word God or how the word God occurs in the book of Acts, is overwhelmingly, I don't want to say 100%, but like very, very, very high percentage of usages of the word God, theos in the Greek, refers to the Father, and it's crystal clear, crystal clear. So if the normal usage of the word God by Peter in the book of Acts is as a reference to the Father, what would happen if we just put the Father in here for God? You have not lied to man, but to the Father. Suddenly, our problems disappear, right? Uh, lying to the Holy Spirit just is lying to the Father, because it's the Father's Spirit. It's His own personal presence that is inside of Peter instructing him and, and, and giving him guidance so that he knows that this Ananias is a liar. That's the Father doing that in Peter. It's not another individual. Another one is in Matthew 12 here, where we talk about uh, Jesus casting out demons, right? There's this demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, was brought to him, and he, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, that's pretty significant, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds a strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. 
And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Jesus equates the Holy Spirit here with the Spirit of God. Do you see that? Uh, Down in the bottom here, you have against the Holy Spirit, and then up here, the Spirit of God. They're not different to Jesus. You know, he, in one case, he says Spirit of God. In another case, he says Spirit. And then in another case, he says Holy Spirit. It's God's Spirit. And so what is really going on here? Well, I think a, a parallel might really help on verse 28 here, where it says, But it is by the Spirit, if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And Luke, he says, If it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons. Isn't that interesting? I don't think there's a contradiction there. I think they're saying the same thing, just different ways. That the spirit, like God's spirit is like his finger. Like, what does your finger do? You know, it does stuff. It moves things around. You use your fingers to brush your teeth, to make your dinner, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's your way of interacting with the world. I think that's a really helpful definition for the spirit. And so Jesus here is talking about his father, He's talking about God. So what's going on? Jesus is casting out a demon. Everyone's amazed. They're all just like, can this be the son of David? Can this be the son of David? The Pharisees are all over here, and they're all just like, that ain't no son of David. He's he's just casting out spirits by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. So the accusation on the Pharisees is that Jesus is using Satan and satanic power to do these miracles. Jesus refutes that by saying, well, that's just ridiculous, man. If Satan's fighting Satan, Satan's, his whole house, how is it going to stand? But if it's by the Spirit of God that I do these things, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And uh, then he goes on to say, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. What did they do? They called what Jesus was doing satanic. They, and what was Jesus doing? Jesus was acting by the Spirit of his Father, by, this, by God's Spirit. And so what they were doing was they were calling God's activity in the world devilish. That's what they were doing. And so that's what Jesus is talking about here. To blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to blaspheme the Father in action. And therefore, it is a really big deal. But in verse 32, what else is interesting is that he says, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. So you can, you can blaspheme against Jesus, and it's forgivable. But if you blaspheme against this miraculous event that, he's taught, that he was demonstrating, and this guy was healed of this demon, and you're going to call that the devil at work, or Beelzebul, or however you want to slander it, then he says, look, that's it, you're done. I don't think this is evidence for the Spirit's personality. I think it's just evidence for how seriously we have to take it when God does things through different people, especially through Jesus. All right, then last up we have the upper room. This is John 14 through 16. And this is where we get this special terminology, paraclete. Normally, the Spirit vocabulary is ruach or pedevma, or the two Hebrew and Greek words translated spirit. Um, but then once we get to John 14, suddenly we get this other word, this word paraclete, or parakletos in the Greek, and it means advocate or helper. Uh, the old translations had comforter. And uh, what we see here on the slide here is that the Spirit in John 14 and 16 does things that only persons can do. Only an individual, a self, can do these things. I guess a dog could abide with you, right? But generally, it's a person, Right? Uh, or a pet, I guess. But yeah, John 14, 17 says the Spirit will abide with you. John 14, 26 says the Spirit teaches you all things. John 14, 26 also says the Spirit brings to your remembrance. John 15, 26, the Spirit testifies about me, Jesus. John 16, 8, the Spirit convicts the world. John 16, 13, the Spirit guides you into all truth and will not speak on its own initiative. And it hears, or he hears, speaks, discloses. John 16, 14 the Spirit will glorify me, take of mine, and disclose to you. I suppose um, that it could be here that Jesus is introducing a whole new doctrine of the Holy Spirit, whereby it would take theologians 
300 years to find the language to express it. I guess that's possible. I think that's unlikely, though. I will not deny this, though, that Jesus uses personal language to talk about the Holy Spirit in John 14 and 16. I think denying that is really just going against what the Bible clearly says. So we have two options. We have two options. Other than to just say that the the paraclete is this third heavenly individual, uh, we have two other options. One is to recognize that this could be personification. And uh, at the end of this discourse, Jesus says in John 16, 25, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. This is like the same exact chapter we were just looking at all these, all these interesting, unusual, talking about the, the spirit as if it's a he. And then he, he gets to the end of it and he says, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I, will no longer, when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. So it could be personification, which happens all over the Bible. Proverbs 8, Lady Wisdom is in the beginning with God creating the world. 1 Corinthians 13, love does not brag. Well, love's not a person. Love is an action or it's a noun, right? But it's not, it's not a person. Uh, so it could be personification where Jesus is talking about the Spirit as if it's an independent person using a figure of speech called personification. Or it could be that Jesus is talking about his own his, him, his own self in the third person because he's talking about the role he's going to have in the age to come when he's non-physically present and yet still able to help them, advocate for them, comfort them. Uh, and so I want to show you this. This is, a, this is a chart where I have on the left side what we read about the Spirit in John 14 to 16, and on the right side, what we read about Jesus in John 14 to 16. And on the left side, I'm just going to go right down it. It says, he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That's John 14, 16. 14, 26, the helper of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you. John 15, 26, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. John 16, 7, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. The impression you get from looking at that collection of verses is that the spirit, one of the main things Jesus is telling his disciples, this is right before he's arrested, crucified, raised, and ascended, all that sequence is just about to happen, This is his last time with his disciples, and he's preparing them for life without him. And so what is he saying over and over? He's saying the Spirit will come. The Spirit will come. I'm going to send the Spirit. The Spirit's going to be awesome. It's going to do all these things, right? Or he's going to do all these things. And then on the right hand, in the same speeches, Jesus says over and over and over to them, I will come. So in John 14, 3, I will come again and receive you to myself. Uh, John 14, 18, I will come to you, Jesus speaking. John 14, 17, you know that I am in the Father and you and me and I in you. John 14, 21, I will love him and will disclose myself to him. John 14, 23, we will come to him and make our abode with him. John 14, 28, I go away and I will come to you. John 16, 17, a little while and you will see me. So when we think about the coming of Christ, I believe there are two comings. One is, the obvious one, when he returns at the end to resurrect the saints and establish God's kingdom. I mean, that's totally non-controversial. Jesus is coming back. Amen. Hallelujah. But there's a second coming that Jesus is talking about here because he says to them, in a little while, the world will not see me, but you will see me. What's he talking about? Did he just like get wrong the timing of his coming? (laughs) I can't go that that way with you. But uh, I think what he's talking about is that he's coming, he's going to go to the Father, and then he's going to come back and make his abode, his dwelling with his disciples through the Spirit. So I think Jesus is actually talking in a figure of speech, but it's not the figure of speech personification, but it's a, uh, a, a way of speaking of himself in the third person. In uh, 1 John 2, 1, this is another interesting fact. You have this word translated advocate or helper. It's only used five times in the whole Bible. 
or at least in the New Testament. Four of the times are in John 14 to 16, where Jesus is at the Last Supper. The fifth time is written by the same author, John, but it's applied to Jesus now that he's in heaven. So, 1 John 2, 1, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have a paraclete, is what it says in the Greek, parakletos, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So now that when 1 John uh, is, is written and, it, and it's focused, he's thinking, oh, well, Christ is now ascended at the Father's right hand. He's advocating for us. He, he just is our paraclete. Um, and so I think that's, that's pretty convincing as well. And there are other indications that Jesus and the Spirit are used interchangeably. For example, in Mark 13, 11, um, Jesus tells his disciples if they get arrested, don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit will tell them what to say. But in Luke 21, Jesus says, for I will give you utterance and wisdom. Um, in Romans 8, 9, it says, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but in Romans 8.10, the next verse, it says, if Christ is in you. You know, there, there's an interchangeableness between the Spirit and Christ. And I believe that's very simply explained by the fact that Jesus is present via the Spirit. That's how Christ, you know, it's how God was present with us and still is present with us. But now that Christ has ascended, Christ is also present with us through the Spirit. So it's the Spirit of God, it's the Spirit of Christ it's Christ. It, you know, they're all interchangeable because they're all used in the same sense. Um, so let's summarize. The Spirit is not a person, but the projection of a person, the risen Christ within the believer. Do you agree with me that Christ is in heaven? He's not here? Do you also agree with me that Christ is in you? So you already know what I'm trying to say here, right? Um, Christ is the one who searches the minds and hearts. Revelation 2.23. He is the head of the body who causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. The risen Christ is with us always and in the midst of two or three gathered in his name. Yet at the same time, he is not here. He is seated at the right hand of God in heavenly places. So how can Christ be near to his church even while he's in heaven? Or to put the question differently, how could he disclose himself to his disciples without the world seeing him? Christ is present through His Spirit. The Spirit which proceeds from the Father connects Christ to His body like a nervous system, making Him aware of what is going on and allowing Him to coordinate His body. I experience Christ via the Spirit, so to me the Spirit is Christ in me. Let's review. Number one, throughout the majority of the Scriptures, God's Spirit simply refers to God's presence or activity. Number two, God's Spirit is how He can be present, imminent, even while He is in heaven, transcendent. Number three, we looked at five reasons why the Spirit cannot be an independent person from the Father, including not having a name, never sending greetings, being God's, never receiving prayer, and getting left out of key texts. Number four, lying to God's Spirit is lying to God, the Father, just as blaspheming His Spirit amounts to blasphemy against Him. And number five, the paraclete of John 14 and 16 is either a personification of the Spirit or it is Jesus in his heavenly role. So those are some thoughts about the Holy Spirit. Next time we're going to look at church history. I wish I could say more about the Holy Spirit, you know, because there's a whole gift of the Spirit, manifestations of the Spirit. There's, there's so much more to say about it, very important stuff. Uh, but I'm just focusing on this one angle of the subject. And so we'll look at history next time in our class as we continue through one God overall.